Well, I'd like to welcome you to another episode or another installment of our uh, discipleship time for this week. This week, we're going to be continuing our study on the kingdom. Let me share my screen so you can see what's going on here. Um, so again, I'd like to welcome you again. Um, heard some great feedback. So if you're watching this for the first time or the second time or or, or whatever throughout the time, give us, a, give us some comments or some feedback and let us know what's working, what's not working, what you would like to see a little bit extra, a little bit deeper. Um, apparently, uh, Pastor Joel has dubbed this Digging Deeper with Dr. Martin, which is, I laughed when I saw that, but uh, this opportunity is, th this time is an opportunity that we can go a little bit deeper than we can in a typical Sunday morning time when um, we have a larger crowd. But again, this avenue, this um, technology that we're trying to use, we're trying to um, give you the opportunity to to view it at your own pace, your own time, so that you can can study this, can lead others, and so let's let's dive right in um, to this week's part two of the kingdom. And this week we're going to be looking at the king. Last week, just to give you a um, just a brief overview or synopsis of what um, we did, uh, we just kind of introduced what the kingdom what what kingdoms were um i talked about the history of kingdoms especially when it has to do to our judeo-christian um history and so we talked about just and i went really fast over a period of about 1500 years and so if you want to go deeper than that we'll have to do that to a specific setting but as it relates to the overall kingdom um, that we're talking about here i, I want to give you a background in that, so this week we're going to look at the king, um, and of course how all that points uh, to King Jesus. Um, next week we're going to be talking about um, the realm of the king, and then um, you see it there, so I don't have uh, to read through it. But I wanted to give you that each week, so you kind of kind of know what where where we've been and where we're heading. So um, today's installment again, we're going to talk about the king. Um, just to give you a brief out, outline of what I hope to talk about in the next 25 or 30 minutes or so is I'm going to talk about exactly what is a king because we as um, we in the United States, we don't really have that background about what a king is. And so I wanted to give you that kind of background um, and then um, talk about how the king is coming, the king has arrived, and then, of course, the king is coming back. And so I, I, I want to give you... Um, the scriptures that point to that. Again, this is not a, um, I don't want to get bogged down in anything. This is kind of an overview of King Jesus as the king um, and how everything kind of points to him. So um, again, if you have any questions or feed, feedback, please please leave that in the comments and we'll certainly address those. All right, so so exactly what is a king? And again, I, I just mentioned very, very, very briefly that um, we don't have a background in living in a kingdom, and so there are not many modern kings left. So when it comes to looking at what a king, we have to look historically, and a king is, of course, a male who is a monarch. Um, usually that king becomes a king because of a genealogical line, their dad, their grandfather, their on and on and on was the line of kings. And, and so um, when somebody dies, then the next heir to the throne becomes the king. Um, we see that, um, well, we probably, you're familiar with not long ago when uh, the Queen of England passed away that um, Prince Charles became the king now. And he's King Charles, so he was the next in line to the throne. So that's probably the only contemporary model of a king that we know um, and that male monarch um, that king is over a specific region at a specific time and so there is a kingdom to that he is a supreme ruler and i thought it was interesting when i did a little research on him being a supreme ruler it did give the caveat that unless there is an emperor so when we look at um, the roman empire 
there were several, um, you can read through the New Testament and see all kinds of kings. There was King Herod, um, King Agrippa. There was all kinds of kings. Those weren't, from the research that I gathered, those kind of kings were not, um, as we think of a king as the ruler. The, the, the emperor was actually um, the supreme ruler of that time. And so it, it does get a little confusing when you're, reading through uh, the scriptures and of course we, we king herod in the new testament very very early in the gospels um there was several king herods of course um in that line um he was seen as immortal by his crown so he he was he was seen as he he will live forever whether physically um or spiritually in their own minds he he was seen as um immortal so um, just to give you a quick familiarity of the kings of history, again, I, I, the, the, the most familiar ones we're going to see are the ones we, we've read through in the Bible. Um, the king of Egypt was known as the Pharaoh, King Ramesses. There was a long line, Ramesses I, Ramesses II, and so, so, so forth. Again, this is not a um, history class, but again, it kind of gives us historical background. Um, first three kings of Israel um, in our Judeo Christian history, King Saul, um, King David, King Solomon, and then there was a long line when the kingdom split into two different sections, the northern king and, and the southern kingdom. Um, there's a long list of those, and it, it, if you're interested in those and, and have that, um, there's all, all kinds of studies on that, and maybe um, we can do a study on that if that's um, where we're kind of led to do next. King Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon. He was the one, of course, that um <clears throat> invaded um he he became the 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 babylonian empire was the top dog when they invaded everybody and of course um deported all the israelites to babylon king cyrus came after babylon king of uh, king of persia so you read about those in um daniel um ezra and nehemiah nehemiah was sent by king cyrus King Darius, those type, those those two people, I think, were off the top of my head. Um, when he came back and rebuilt the wall, Ezra, when he came back and helped uh, to restore the temple, um, and I and I put down just a couple of English monarchs that that we may be a little bit familiar with. King James was, um, of course, uh, instrumental in the 1600s, um, known for having the Bible translated into English. That's where we get the King James Version of the Bible. King Charles is, of course, the king right now. Um, there's all kinds of kings um, in the line, uh, European kings, especially in the English, the England side of things. So um, so let's talk about um, the three things that I, uh, that I want to kind of hunker down on today. Uh, the first one, um, the, the king is coming. As you, as we kind of move through here, I, I think it's very important for us to just get an understanding, a quick understanding of the value of believing in the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. How if you don't have that clear understanding or clear belief that those are three distinct people yet the same person, then really none of this makes sense and has value. So um, I want to give you a couple of scriptures that point to, to that. Genesis 1, 1, of course, in the beginning, God. So I just kind of stopped there. So God was in the beginning. So his creation was was uh, the beginning of what we know. Now, God, again, again this is not a study on the origin of or of the uh, the onset of, of, of everything there, but God created. So God's always been. He wasn't created. But he was the one that created. So in the beginning, or in our beginning, um, there was God. Um, Genesis 1, 26, again, in the creation story, then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. We believe that that is a, um, that points to being the, uh, the Trinitarian um a moment there that that God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit were all there. Even though we're not really introduced to 
per se, God, the Holy Spirit in, in the way that we know it um, until Acts 1, until Acts 1 um, when the Spirit was given during Pentecost. Um, there's all, all kinds of showings or all kinds of, um, of those times where he appeared. Uh, the difference, the main difference that, um, as my understanding goes, is that in the Old Testament, the Spirit was would be on people at a specific time. And there were specific times where you saw the spirit of God descended on or appeared on or was filled with or something of that, that nature. Um, and then it left. And of course, once we get to God, the son and being Jesus, we know that um, when he ascended back into heaven, he sent the Holy spirit. And so there he is with us forever. Now he doesn't come and go. Um, once we become Christian, we are baptized in the Spirit, and so we 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 have that understanding that 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 He is a part of us. So we have that John one one just just point to Jesus. John writes in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and that Word is an iteration of Jesus um, there. So that is the, the belief that Jesus has all always been. Um, with and is a part of who God is. Um, and I wanted to show you Colossians 1, 15 through 20. Um, and this, again, is talking about Jesus. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things and in all things hold hold together and he is the head of the body the church he is the beginning the firstborn from the dead that in everything he might be preeminent for in him all the fullness of god was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things whether on earth or in heaven making peace by the blood of his cross and so again as paul is writing here to the church at Colossae, or at Colossae, um that's the belief that Jesus was um, the image or the physical body of God as he came down to earth. And so when we look at the king is coming, um, again, there's an understanding of the Trinity, but there's also an understanding of the original creation, how creation was created for us so that God could um, come and walk and walk with us. Now, when Adam and Eve were created, they were given dominion and rule over all of creation in the Garden of Eden. Um, they were, were given one restriction, and that is to stay away from the tree um, that they were not supposed to eat, eat of. Um, in Genesis 3, we meet um, the serpent who came to Eve and convinced her that um, she would not die. And they would not die. Her and Adam would not die if they took part of that. So in Genesis 3, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was uh, a delight to the eyes and the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took the fruit, ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were open, and they knew that they were, they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made them so as self loincloths. Uh, I think I got one more on that. And they heard the sound of the Lord walking. And uh, this is where I just want you to get an understanding. Then they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. So this is a clear picture to me that God created um, at the first creation. Um, Eden, Eden was created to be um, his kingdom here on, on the earth where he can have fellowship and, and walk and talk with his creation, uh, man. But once sin entered into that, there was a, a break. There was a break in that fellowship. There was something that um, there was sin that because um, God cannot be around sin, God cannot look upon sin. Um, then that's where that first um, separation of the fellowship happened. Um, I want to show you that's the beginning at the very end of the Bible in Genesis in uh, Revelation 21. 
Um, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the, the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And so I just wanted to show you there that um, the contrast between the beginning and the end, there's going to be a new heaven, a new earth, um, where that new earth um, is going to descend, that new that that new city, Jerusalem, um, is going to come down. And so what was created in, in the beginning and was broken because of the sin that um, people had there with um, against God, that we are eventually going to be able to have that back with him um, at the very end. Uh, le let me give you uh, um, just a few prophecies that point to Jesus as the coming king. A again, the Old Testament points to Jesus is, is coming. Once you had that break in fellowship between God and his creation, um, then there had to be a sacrifice made because there, there, there had to be a bloodshed for there to, uh, to be fellowship between God and his creation. And so all of the Old Testament was pointing to the the king that was coming, but he wasn't coming as the king that was going to rule then. He was actually coming as the Messiah who was going to, to die um, and be that sacrifice um, upon the cross. He was buried for three days in the tomb. And then, of course, um, we know that he rose again on the third day to be our Savior. So let me give you a few of these. Isaiah 7, 14, very familiar. We just came out of the Christmas season here. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Uh, Micah 5, 2, again, a very familiar Christmassy scripture. But you, O uh, Bethlehem Ephrathah, you, were, you who are too uh, little to be among the clans of Judah, for you shall come forth to me one who is to be a ruler in Israel, who's coming forth is from of old, from ancient of days. In Psalm 8, 6, you, shall, you have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. Isaiah 9, 6 through 7, um, again, another very familiar Christmassy type scripture for unto us, for to us a child is born. To us the Son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting God, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his, his government and of peace, there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom. And that's the that's the kicker there at the end. He's going to be of the, the, the throne of David um, and then the kingdom. To, uh, to establish it, to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. Psalm 24, 8 through 10, who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is the king of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. All right, so that's that's how what that's just a few of the scripture. There's there's a ton of scriptures that we can look at prophetic scriptures that talk about the Messiah coming um, as King that point to Jesus. Now, um, let's shift gears here to our second little thought here um, and talk about the King is, <clears throat> excuse me, the King has come. Um, and again, um, as we're doing the study, we're in the middle of January. We just came out of the Christmas season, and so. These things are very familiar for us. Um, and again, my, my statement, my thesis um, behind this is that Jesus came the first time not to be um, held, not to be established as far as um, an earthly king would establish his throne, but he came doing the preparation work so that he could become the sacrifice so that one day when he comes back, he's going to be established as king. Um, so the king was recognized by the wise men at birth in Matthew 2. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod, the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? 
for we saw a star when it rose and have come to worship him. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, they fell down and worship him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. Of course, there's been several um, sermons preached upon those, but just as an overall thought here, the wise men, um, these, these magi, um, they recognized the deity um, that the baby had. And so they, they offered him gifts. They, they fell down and they worshiped him there. And so that just kind of gives you a quick little thought. Even as a baby, he, he was recognized um, as being the king that has come. So we were shifting from his birth really quickly um, to the, to the end times. Um, so in John 12, one through eight, John writes six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave him, so they gave a dinner there. Martha served and Lazarus is one uh, of those reclining with him at the table. Uh, Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance um, of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, uh, parenthetically here, the, he was about to betray him, said, why was his ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief and having charged the money bag, he used it to help himself to what was put into it. Jesus said, leave her alone that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you will have always, but you do not always have me. So Mary, in this instant, was anointing him. Um, you can look at it both ways, and I think both are very true. Um, Jesus talks about he, she was that she was anointing him, getting ready for his death, but also a king would be anointed. Um, I didn't put that scripture in, but I, I have the thought back in. First Samuel, when um, the prophet Samuel was going to anoint, he first anointed Saul as king, and then eventually went to anoint Sam, uh, to David to anoint him. He poured oil on him, and so he anointed him, and that's kind of where now we think of the anointed one um, as not being literally anointed, but um, especially back in those days, they were at, they were literally anointed with with oil. Um, and so as we're moving to the, uh, what we know on this side of history as the, um, the passion time where Jesus was heading to Jerusalem, where he would be, um, he, he would be arrested, would be tried in a fake trial, would be, um, abused um, for us would eventually be hung on a cross and died. So this is kind of the beginning of the week that we know as Palm Sunday, but I wanted to, to just kind of show you how um, this kind of all fits together. John 12, 12, the next day, the large crowd had came, had come to the feast, heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took uh, the branches and palm trees and went out to meet him crying, Hosanna, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. Um, we know that the people, the Jews, the Israelites were, were, were looking for a king. They knew, they, they recognized that the Messiah was coming. They had belief in that from Old Testament scripture, some of that which we just read a few moments ago. But they had in their mind that this king was coming to establish that earthly king dumb now. And so they were under the rule of the Roman empire, um, which it, most of the time was very abusive and very bad for them. And so they, they said, well, here comes this guy riding on a donkey. And of course that fulfilled all of the scriptures that they knew as the Messiah. So they, they were yelling Hosanna, uh, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Um, John 18 shows um, 
from Jesus on mouth as he is being interviewed by Pilate on what he says. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, do you say this on your own accord or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered you, am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews, but my kingdom is not from the world. Then Pilate said to Jesus, so you are a king. Um, jump to Hebrews. One, he is a radiance of the glory of God. And the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Um, so all these point to the fact that Jesus was the king that has come. So we have... So we have in the scriptures in the Old Testament, um, and I gave you my justification or my thought for saying that there was a need for that um, Messiah, that king to come, um, but not to establish the, the kingdom then necessarily as it would be at the end. Um, there is a kingdom now, and we will talk about that in a few, few uh, later sessions. But um, for this sake, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, Pointing toward the fact that the king has arrived, he has come, um, but he was going back to his kingdom um, in heaven to where he will come back. And so that's kind of where I wanted to end this session is talk about, give you some scriptures that show that the king is coming back. We're not being left here by ourselves. Acts 1.8, very familiar passage to you, but you'll receive power. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, to the ends of the earth. And when he had said these things, they were looking on. As they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes, said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. So he is coming back. Matthew 24, immediately after the tribulation of those things, those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of heaven that will be shaken. Then will appear in the heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds from the one end of heaven to the other. And then, of course, the main scriptures that we look as far as the second coming, um, I want to jump to the, back to the book of Revelation. Um, in Revelation 19, it says, Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. This will be one of the great things you you, you want to see. Um, we, we, we hear apocalyptically, and I may have just made up that word, but, of course, apocalyptic things point toward the end times. Um, you see all kinds of movies and stories written about that great white horse. Well, here he is. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes wars. His eyes are like a flame of fire on his head and are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God, the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has the name written King of Kings 
and Lord of Lords. Revelation 22 says, and this is at the very end of the book. This is the very end of the coming. And these are some of the last words um, of Jesus. Or man, I have to go back and look. I think that may even be the last words. Um, and behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words, the prophecy of this book. And so I just want to show you that we talk about the fact that the king, um, his kingdom. So I wanted to introduce you today, this session to the king, um, and about how the scriptures point out the fact that from Genesis to Malachi, that the king is coming. Um, historically, we know that there was a great time of darkness or of silence between um when Malachi was completed or the end of the Old Testament to the beginning of the New Testament, about 400 years of silence. Um, and here comes John, um, declare, John the Baptist declaring that Jesus is here. Um, and so that fulfilled all the scriptures, some of which I showed you during, during the session. Of course, there's many, many more. Um, I wouldn't, I would not have the time on this particular instance to show you all of those um and so jesus um came jesus of course died for us was hung on a cross buried three days later arose and now all the signs and everything now that we have is now pointing to his coming back to establish his king um his kingdom here on this earth um, just as we end here, let me show you just a, just two or three implications uh, for practice as we kind of close down today. Uh, the understanding is that Jesus is the king. Um, you cannot separate Jesus and God, and the Holy Spirit. You have to look at it both in the, the whole Trinitarian viewpoint as well as the individual purposes of each of those um, pieces of the Godhead um, and the importance of each of those. Um, Jesus as the King. And of course, as I mentioned before, Jesus came first to be the Messiah. Um, and his purpose in that was to be that sacrifice for us so that we wouldn't have to um, go through the sacrificial process of, of animal sacrifice. There could be that one true sacrifice that tore the rent of the curtain from top to bottom so that we may have access to the Father from this point on. And of course, one day he is going to return um, as Lord and as King um, in Philippians. Um, I think it's in Philippians 3. At the end, it says that, that one day every knee will bow and every tongue will, will confess that Jesus is Lord. Um, I wanted to leave you today with this thought. I heard this scripture. My head's in the way I think of this, and I'm not going to be able to move it per se. Yeah, I did. There I am. So, because I, I wanted to get you this thought. We hear the scripture read a lot at funerals and about how people are, you know, you don't have to worry about it when people die that are in Christ. Um, I heard a, <clears throat> I heard a sermon preached not long ago, and it talked about this in a perspective of a Jewish wedding, it will be more accurate how this is looked at. Um, Jesus being the bride um, would go and prepare a place. Um, the groom, excuse me, I think I said the bride, the, the, the groom, Jesus, would go and prepare a place. And then when that place is ready, when that groom has gone off to prepare a place, whether it's building on to his father's place or he had to go build his own place, once that prepared, once that house or place is prepared, then that groom would come back, the groom being Jesus here, would come back and take his bride with him. And we are the bride of Christ. So let me, in those terms, read you this scripture. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? 
And if I go to prepare and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way I to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have also known my Father also. From now on, do you know him? you do know him and have seen him? If you're watching this today, and this is the first time you've heard about Jesus or the millionth time you've heard about Jesus and something is is speaking to you and saying, I, I, I need to know this Jesus um, before he returns back as king. Because when he returns, that time for accepting is over. Now is the time to get in into the kingdom. Let me just invite you. There's no special words. There's no special um, prayer. Just, just admit that you've sinned. We all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, as Paul wrote. And we all mess up. But the difference is, when I, as a Christian, mess up, I'm forgiven by the blood of Christ, and it's not held against me anymore. So pray to God and say that I am a sinner, and I need you to be my Savior. And please give you, please take over my life. And then give him control of your life. If you've done that for the first time, that's truly, would you please reach out to us, leave a comment, send us a message, whatever you need to do to let us know. We don't want to bombard you with a bunch of materials. We just want to go along beside you and help you. Because it is so important to recognize Jesus as the king. Because again, when he comes back, he's coming back on a white horse and he's coming back to establish his kingdom and he's only going to have those that belong to him, his bride. And you need to get on that while you can. Thank you again for listening today and being attentive. Um, I pray that as we continue to do this, that um, we'll continue to grow both deeper and wider um, as Christians. Um, I pray that everything that um, you need. If there's anything you do need, would you please let us know? Um, other than that, I hope you have a great week, a great um, time there. And let me pray for you before we end this today. God, I thank you for all that you've done for us. Thank you for being our king. Help us through um, those troubles and times that we have. We give you all the glory and all the praise in Christ's name. Amen. God bless you.